As we all know, getting around the city, getting here tonight has gotten a lot easier over the last five years uh, for a lot of reasons, and usually not because of investment in public transportation, unfortunately. Um, Uber, Lyft, they all change the landscape. You can add Via to the mix in a big way. Uh, it's a service that's both ride sharing, ride hailing, and public transportation all combined into one. And Daniel Ramot, the co-founder and CEO, is here, and I'm thrilled to be able to talk to him about it. Daniel, a lot of our featured guests for Cornell Tech kind of knew early on that they wanted to start their own business. It was just a matter of coming up with the right idea. And you are one of the people who just, you, you knew that this was where you were headed. And you met your co-founder in the Israeli Air Force in the 1990s. And I know that you guys kind of threw around a whole bunch of different ideas about what kinds of companies you're gonna start. What ideas did you propose and kind of dispose of before they really had a chance to, to come to fruition? Thanks, Carla. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, one of the ideas that I, I've talked about before is uh, this was uh, Oren's idea. He still believes it's a good one, by the way. Is uh, we were going to create. You know how you're all uh, just inundated with email, and there's too much email that we get. Uh, we were going to uh, develop a very smart filter that would randomly delete fifty percent of your incoming emails um, and just save you the trouble. And we figured if someone was really interested, they just email you again. And uh, you know they have a fifty percent chance of getting through that time, so they'd have to be persistent. Uh, we decided that uh, uh, that was not going to work. Although you know we may come back to it one day. All right, if so that, that's a, that's out. kind of on the back burner. It could that's happen again. Burner. All right, um, education-wise, you have a uh, master's degree in electrical engineering, and you moved on from Israel to come to the U.S. to get a PhD in neuroscience. Not an easy uh, field of study. How do you apply your knowledge of the brain and how it works to what you do now, which is managing team, teams of people, 600 people in your company right now, managing people, managing operations around the world? Um, yeah, you know, uh, my, my mother likes to say that uh, with all my education, I ended up a taxi dispatcher. Oh. And, uh, she wonders <laughs> how, how that happens, uh, Jewish mothers. Um, but uh, I, you know, I, I think that the, Studying uh, in grad school and academia, I, I don't know that there's a specific thing that I learned about neurobiology and neuroscience that I use today, to be totally honest. But the general uh, concepts and training that you get, I, I think in grad school, spending five years in grad school, of, of working with data, thinking about how to collect data in the right way, how to think about it, how to analyze it, how to present it, um, what works and doesn't work as far as running experiments, and, and managing uh, very large volumes of data, and then using that to tell a story. Because I think everything we do in life in the end, we're telling some sort of story, whether it's to our, our investors or to our employees. And by story, I don't mean that it's made up. I mean that we're taking the data that we have and trying to present it in a way that's compelling, that will make people want to work with you or, or invest in the company or partner with you. And, and being able to tell a story, I think that's a lot of times what great academics, what different great academics from just good academics. And that's something that I, I feel I took away from that. All right, and after that, after you got your PhD, and before you became a glorified taxi dispatcher, yes, is that what she said? that's right, yeah. Um, you also worked at D.E. Shaw Research. Uh, we know of D.E. Shaw as this hedge fund that's uh, famous for using computers and algorithms to trade. Um, and you were there during the financial crisis. You weren't doing that at D.E. Shaw. You were doing something else at D.E. Shaw. What were you doing, and how did that contribute to what you do now? Yeah, so D.E. Shaw uh, is, as you know, as you mentioned, the hedge fund. Uh, there's this another company, a sister company, founded by the same gentleman, by David Shaw, uh, called D.E. Shaw Research, that is effectively a biotech company. And that's where I went to work, where David is trying to apply the same approaches that were very successful for him at D.E. Shaw and company uh, for trading uh, uh, in the public markets to drug discovery and drug, uh, pharmaceutical drug design and discovery. And what we did there was we used computational techniques and computers, and we actually built a supercomputer, uh, not quite the size of this room, maybe about a quarter of the size of this room, uh, to try to discover new pharmaceutical drugs. And that supercomputer had custom hardware that we designed and built and software uh, that ran biological simulations extremely quickly so that we could simulate how drug molecules interacted with proteins. And I think you know that was mainly an engineering and a scientific mm. challenge. And my job there was uh, to oversee the, the supercomputer project, effectively. I think what I took away from there is it was really interesting to see how D. Shaw, and that applies both to the hedge fund and to this uh, sister company, the D. Shaw Research, how they think about culture and how they think about hiring uh, and how they think about building a team and what that means. And I had never been exposed to that. You know, spent time in the Air Force and working with military contractors in Israel, and then 
uh, in grad school uh, in California, but had never really seen a company like the Shaw Research, which I think is quite unique. And I, I took a, away a, a lot from that about how to build a great team. Creating a corporate culture, really. Creating a corporate culture, creating the right corporate culture, mm -hmm. how to think about that. D. Shaw is really well known for being extremely selective about who they hire. Mm -hmm. They don't always get it right, but every once in a while. Uh, uh, so I, I think that there was, a, there was really a lot to learn about how they thought about that, how they thought about talent. Okay, well, speaking of talent, you manage Kavia with your co-founder. He's your chief technology officer right now. It can be a fraught relationship to have a co-founder that you work so closely with, especially since you guys were friends for so many years beforehand. How do you manage that relationship? And how did your time at DE Shaw Research inform that ability to manage this relationship? Yeah, that's, I, I think that's one of the keys, honestly, to our success. I think while you know, Or and I early on decided that I was, I was based in New York, I was already here, he was in Tel Aviv, we knew we wanted to build a technology team in Tel Aviv and hire all of our engineers there, and we knew that we wanted the business to be based in the United States, and so we agreed that I would take on the CEO role and he would take on the CTO role. But the reality is that we run the company together. Mm -hmm. He has certain areas that he focuses on day to day, I have certain areas that I focus on day to day. We could, we could be, in some sense, interchangeable, we could just switch. And we make all of the big decisions together, and we just talk a lot. I'm probably on the phone with him. If there's a day that goes by that we don't talk, that's very strange. And many days we're on the phone for an hour or two, and we just talk about everything. And I think the key, which I also try to, we, we just had, I was mentioning to you earlier, we had uh, our, our VIA uh, kickoff uh, uh, for the team uh, starting today, and we talked about culture. And one of the things that I try to talk about a lot is um, a concept that, you know, very simple, that we call benefit of the doubt, where we, you, we give each other the benefit of the doubt. So if something goes wrong and we're across the, each other, across the ocean from each other and it's so easy and it's a seven hour difference and you're tired and he's tired and it's so easy to think, what the hell are you doing, man? How did this happen or what's wrong with you? And instead of that, just you give the other person the benefit of the doubt and say, hey, listen, this, uh, you know, I'm assuming that you, you were busy or that this, you sort of assume that they, they, they had good judgment and they try to do their best and maybe you think it didn't work out, maybe you're wrong and you have a conversation about that. And I think that's worked out really well for us. Okay, the assumption of good intentions from the Good intentions, that they are doing a good job, that it's worth, you know, you may not think that, but you're probably missing something. Mm. And it's worth talking about that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how this all adds up, and VIA in particular, because um, the company was inspired by the concept of shared vans that run routes parallel to the bus lines in Israel. It's called a Sharut. Right. How did that first? How did that idea first come about, and what struck you about it when Oren proposed it? Yeah, so Oren called me with this idea. He claims I'm not sure this is true, by the way, but he claims that he was <laughs> trying to take one of these Sharu taxis and uh, was Remember, waiting for intentions. one. Remember, good intentions. Good intentions. That's right. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, thank you, Scarlett. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, these vans basically run routes, fixed routes. They're not very techy. Uh, if you've gone, if you've been in Africa or in Mexico, they have colectivos or matatus. And, you know, you have these vans all over the world, mashutkas in Russia, and we have them in Israel. And you stand on the, on the side of the road and you basically wait for one to go by and then you raise your hand and it stops. And you get in and you pass your payment and cash up to the front and the driver passes the change back and sort of like this very nice uh, system. And Oren claims that he, uh, Oren was, benefit of the doubt, was waiting for one of these vans and uh, several vans went by that were full. Uh, he couldn't get a seat. So he had the idea that, well, what if you could book a seat on your phone so that you knew uh, um, this was sort of 2012-ish. Uh, everybody had smartphones. You knew that you were guaranteed a seat. And then he started to think, well, if you could do that and you put in your origin and your destination, then all of a sudden maybe we could start to change the routes because we knew where people were and where they needed to go. So we wouldn't have to kind of stick to the fixed routes. We could just create routes in real time. And wouldn't that be an interesting bus system? A bus system that's fully dynamic, where the vehicles are all completely changing their routes in real time based on demand. And so he called me with that idea, and we have a tendency to sort of understand each other within the first few words. So he started talking about it, and I said, this is an amazing idea. We have to do this. And uh, that's how we ended up here. Why do you think this concept, you said that you have these little mini buses running all over the world. Right. But you don't have that in New York, up until VIA. You didn't have that, let's say, in London, Western European cities. Why do you think that is? I, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure. So we have them a little bit in New York. We have, uh, we have these dollar vans, if you guys have been out to Bushwick, uh, uh, in, in, in there. they have them in Queens, they, they run between the Chinatowns. Uh, so they exist. In New York in particular, I, I think this is a very uh, local phenomenon. I think in New York, at least my understanding is that there were actually quite a lot of these vans running around. And then um, there was a lot of politics around them, particularly some resistance from the bus drivers union. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the city council passed certain laws that made them illegal. So today these dollar vans are for the most part either illegal or gray. Uh, so there's a regulation 
that sort of works against them. And I think that's true in some other, other parts of the country uh, that, that have led to that. Now, having said that, I don't entirely know why we don't have them. Uh, it's a little bit strange. I think they're an incredibly effective way of getting around, just, just the, you know, the straight line, hop on and off uh, sort of things. So what was your impression of buses before you began work on VIA, before you did all your due diligence, before you dug into why these dollar vans kind of existed and then you know, were regulated out of existence? So I, 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 I have to confess, I love public transportation. I, I love the subway. Uh, I used to take buses all the time. Now I take VIA. Yeah. Uh, but I, um, I, really, I really think public transit is fantastic. And I don't like driving. So one of the things I love about New York is I, I don't like driving. A few years ago, my wife bought a car. It is definitely her car. I have nothing to do with it. <laughs> uh, so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I still don't own a car. And uh, I, I think it's uh, it's just, it's such a it's, it's such a release from having to drive when you can just get anywhere uh, in, in public transportation. However, I think public transit is very limited. And there are many times where it's just very slow or the route doesn't work for you and, and you just it's just not the right solution. And that's even within a city like New York where we have the density to run fixed route buses most hours of the day. So to me, the idea that you could add this, this entirely new mode that's smart, that's dynamic, that's data-driven, we, we don't deploy vans when we don't need them. We only deploy them at times when they're really needed. And we put them in the right places to capture the demand uh, using, again, data and algorithms. That feels really smart and I think can be a, a way to solve a lot of our traffic and emissions problems. And certainly one solution out there among many. Just one solution. Now, you really took your time with the launch of VIA. Um, you had your day job, and you kind of worked on it on weekends with Orrin. In retrospect, I know you've said that you would recommend people move a lot faster, that that was not the way to go. Why was that? I mean, you took your time, you did your due diligence, you surveyed people. That brought you new understanding. Why wasn't that the right approach? Yeah, or the this, best approach. This is, the, this is my number one advice, not that you're asking, but my number one advice to aspiring entrepreneurs uh, is to, if you have an idea and you decide that you believe in it, to just drop everything and go do it as quickly as you can. And I, my question is always when people come to me and say, I'm thinking about this idea, and my, my, my question is, why haven't you done it yet? What's stopping you from doing it right now? And I think uh, this is the one piece of advice that I give, and it's the one piece of advice that no one ever listens to. So <laughs> I, I will say that has never worked for me. And I think that the, the reason is that you have, and this is exactly what happened to us, and it took us about six months of working through this and building simulations and, and doing proof of concepts and talking to people in the transportation industry and building all these budgets and lining up funding so that when we left, we knew we had money up front. Um, and we, we basically de-risked the, the, the exit from our day jobs. You know, I actually really enjoyed my work at D. Shaw. Oren was doing his PhD at the Weizmann Institute in Israel, and he thought of an academic career, and he had a very uh, promising prospects, I think, extremely bright future there. And so there was a real risk to, to leaving those, those jobs and, and just jumping into this idea. So we thought, okay, well, we don't know anything about transportation. Let's go figure this out. Let's go talk to people who know something about transportation. Let's go build some of the initial algorithms and see if they work. And we uh, submitted a Freedom of Information Act to the city of New York, request the city of New York. Uh, I think we were the first to do that, and we got all their taxi GPS data, all the GPS data from the yellow taxis, and we run, ran all these simulations. A few years later, M folks at MIT did that, and they published a really nice study, but we had, that's what we used to basically convince ourselves mm. that this could work, that there were enough people moving around that you could bundle them into these vans and that it was going to be very efficient. And by the time we left, we had a very high degree of confidence that we could, that we could do this, and we had money lined up. So in some sense, we reduced our risk, and that's how, sort of what we were thinking. The reason I don't think it's, and it makes a lot of sense, and maybe all of you are thinking, well, why is that not the right way to go? I think the reason is that the, your most valuable time, most valuable resource as an entrepreneur is time. And when you're doing this as a part-time job, you're not moving as quickly as you can. And while you're reducing the risk of leaving your job, others who are bolder are moving much faster than you. And when you do finally make the jump, you're behind. You have less risk on one hand, but you have a lot more risk because you've now created a situation where you're not as fast as you could have been. And I think that's something that, it's sort of a fallacy that people tend to miss is that actually their most important, the, the biggest risk is being slow. It's not choosing the wrong idea. You could choose the right idea. If you're slow, you'll still lose. So Did you see you any other companies that were, that were coming up fast and, and perhaps were, could take, take you over in coming up with this idea? So we, we were definitely the first to do on-demand shared pooled rides. Mm -hmm. And we probably had a head start on uh, Uber and Lyft with Uber Pool and, and their shared ride. I think we probably, by the time we launched, we had about a year and a half or a year and uh, eight months or so. I think if we'd had another six months, it could have, it could have been very important. You know, mm -hmm. I, I just think every little bit that you have to build up your business, to get it going, 
makes a huge difference. But you didn't know it at the time, we so didn't. you took your time. Why do you think transportation has been rel relatively insulated from technology and from disruption for so long? I mean, before Uber, before Lyft, before you guys, it was kind of just the way it was and everyone just lived with it. Yeah, I, so I can tell you from experience, I think there's a combination of, uh, of sort of regulatory uh, rigidity that makes it very difficult. So, you know, we look back at what Uber did and say they broke all the rules. They also had, you know, perhaps a, a difficult or toxic corporate culture. Mm -hmm. uh, with the, none of that excuses that culture. But I have to say that they really opened the door. The fact that they were willing, and you can say whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, but to basically ignore the existing regulations and just launch their service, uh, and as was Lyft, really changed the, the, the landscape and, and made it possible for other things to happen. And before then, it was just very, very difficult. You had to, working within the existing regulatory structure was extremely limiting. There were very, very few taxis. Uh, you know, vehicles like the ones we were using weren't really available. These dollar vans are illegal, right? So every time someone tried to do even something innovative like having a van, that got regulated out of existence. So there's, there's a regulatory uh, a challenge if you want to do it yourself, which is what we ended up doing here on the Upper East Side. On the other hand, if you try to go, which is actually how we started, we started saying, look, we are, going, we are developing technology for buses. Our buses are just dynamic. Um, it's a brilliant idea. I can't believe no one's ever thought of it. Then we went and read some literature. It turns out people have been thinking about it since the 70s, but they've never done it. But they didn't uh, say it out loud, so. They never, yeah, I mean, they just didn't do it, so we were doing it, so we were the first, so great. Uh, and we thought, well, this, this on-demand technology for buses, I mean, it's brilliant. We'll go talk to the MTA, and the MTA will immediately know that it was brilliant and want to use our technology, and we'll be in the money. It'll be amazing. We'll sell our technology to the MTA, and uh, you know, no one wanted to talk to us. So there, there is, there is a also a rigidity within transit organizations at the time that that I think was in, really impossible to overcome. It's it's changed now, mm -hmm. uh, and I think there are many. We can discuss why that's changed, but now I think many of the organizations, including the MTA, are are very open to discussing using new technologies. But at the time. Either you tried it yourself and then you butted up against regulation, or you tried to go the kind of the, the official route of working with the transit authorities, and, and you really didn't have a partner. Do you see Diaz disrupting transportation? I mean, Uber and Lyft like to say they disrupted transportation. Are you disrupting transportation? No, I, we don't think of it that way. Uh, I know it's very cool to say that you're disrupting, and Silicon Valley really likes that. And so in some sense, maybe we do better from a fundraising perspective we were disruptors. But I don't think so. We, we see ourselves, we've always seen it that way. The reason we launched our service here in New York on the Upper East Side and then expanded the rest of the city and expanded to Chicago and DC and London and so forth was not because we were trying to disrupt the existing transit systems. We wanted to prove that this could work because we couldn't get organizations like the MTA to look at us and use our technology. And then once we proved that it worked, we've come around uh, and now we simply, for the most part, sell our technology mm -hmm. to, to transit authorities, to cities, to transit operators, to corporations, to universities in order to power their transit systems. So we, we see ourselves as enabling uh, transit systems to be better, to be more efficient, to be more effective, to move more people, uh, frankly, to beat the private car. That, that's, that's really our goal, to get cars off the street. And in that sense, we are not disrupting public transportation. I hope that we will disrupt the private car. Mm. That, that if we're going to disrupt anything, that, that is what I'm hoping to do. You decided at the start that you would be collaborative with um, the city, with regulators, with public transportation agencies. How much of this was driven by wanting to go a different way than what Uber and Lyft did? Because they created so many enemies in the process. Um, and Uber really embraced its adversarial relationship with the city and these public entities. Right. You know, I think, I think it's, to be honest, a lot of it just starts from, I, I think it's very hard to divorce these things from your personality. I, mm. I just don't think, my, my attitude is not very confrontational anyway. So I, I don't know that I would have been successful and Oren is much the same. Uh, in, adopting a confrontational pose against uh, the regulators. I think we would have said, we're going to disrupt you. And then they would have said, you shouldn't do that. We said, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, we'll collaborate instead. Know, okay. Uh, so I just don't think that would have worked well for us. So I think it starts from our personality. And then um, w you know, we just saw an opportunity to, mm -hmm. to, to, to go a different route uh, from Uber and Lyft and, and, and get credit for that and build a very different business. And then lastly, at the end of the day, we see ourselves as providing a public service. Mm -hmm. uh, buses, uh, public transit, is a, is a public utility. There are questions of uh, e equity and accessibility. It, it doesn't work if you're disrupting the city. That, that's not what we're disrupting public transit. It just, it just fundamentally is, is in tension with that. So we always thought of what we do as a, as a collaborative endeavor. 
Okay, so Via started uh, on the Upper East Side. You started in Manhattan, on a cor in a corner of Manhattan as well. Were you living in the Upper East Side? I mean, why did you start there? No, I was living on the Upper West Side. Uh, uh, and I started on the Upper East Side because I really enjoyed taking the Crosstown bus, the M86, every morning at 5 or 15 a.m. to go across <laughs> uh, uh, to meet the drivers and give them their equipment uh, every morning. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, I, you know, we started on the Upper East Side because at the time, this was 2013, uh, uh, there was no Second Avenue subway for those of you who, who remember, and so there was a real gap in the public mm -hmm. transit system. So we looked at the city and we said, okay, where is it dense? Uh, um, and there are people who could afford, frankly, a Via at least to start with. Let's let's see what we've got. And then uh, um, people who who just are really uh, starved of transit and don't have a solution. So we started on York Avenue, and then we added sort of First and Second Avenue going to Midtown. And at the time, if you lived on York Avenue, you really didn't have a solution. And so, you know, I, I walked around uh, York Avenue on those weekends and accosted random people and said, hey, if we had the service, would you use it? And then I had a survey, and then most people ran away, and a few hundred <laughs> agreed to sort of answer my survey, which was surprising. And then when we launched, we would literally walk around on York Avenue uh, in the morning and try to find people who looked like they were dressed for work. Uh, so presumably they're going to Midtown and say, hey, do you want a free ride to Midtown? And it turned out that people were willing to get into vans with strangers uh, for free. <laughs> uh, uh, regularly. Uh, uh, men and women, by the way, no, uh, we didn't see much of a difference. And so actually women were much more willing to get in, jump into these random vans uh, than, than men. And, uh, um, reckless uh, commuters here. Reckless commuters, yeah. Um, and by the time they got out of the van, they had down, for the most part, because our drivers were awesome, they had downloaded the app and they were, they were members, we called them. Uh, and we came up with the slogan, uh, I get into vans with strangers. And that's what our t-shirts uh, said. They still do to today, uh, which is kind of fun. And, um, and that's how we started. You know, we started building that, that position. And some of your investors were your early riders as well. That's so right. people on the Upper East Side who you accosted and who got into vans with strangers then right. decided to invest in your they company. They decided to continue with the recklessness and be reckless with their money, not only with their <laughs> uh, physical well-being. Uh, yeah, so some of them loved what we were doing. And... Um, were early investors, they reached out uh, through our just general support email or, or, or they found me somehow and they said, hey, we want to invest. And so we said, okay. Uh, um, I'm not going to say uh, no. Yeah, that's how we got there. So talk about how you think about growth because you start off on the Upper East Side and you had very specific reasons. It was very dense population-wise or a lot of very residential and certainly a need to get to somewhere. How do you think about growth, or how did you think about growth to other parts of the city and to other cities eventually? Yeah. So, sh so Shared rides, growing a, a uh, maybe take a step back, growing a, a two-sided marketplace, which is what we were. We had passengers on one side, riders, and then we had drivers on the other side who had their cars. And we needed to match them. And we needed to have, uh, just like eBay or Airbnb or Uber, we needed to have enough supply, enough drivers, so that when you requested a ride, you, were, you had a good chance of getting a, a good wait time, a short wait time. And we needed to have enough riders so that the drivers weren't sitting around waiting. Um, and so we needed to find that balance, just like any other two-sided marketplace. We had an additional challenge in that we were charging, say, $5 for that ride. So even if we had a passenger and a driver, that wasn't enough. We were losing a ton of money on that first passenger. We needed four passengers to be asking at the same time to get into, into that van so that we could make 20 bucks for that ride so that we could pay the driver enough so that the driver would leave or we would have to guarantee which is what we end up doing, guaranteeing what the driver is going to make. So we had this, this sort of... Uh, I think exacerbated the problem of not only having to have enough drivers and passengers, but actually having to have scale mm -hmm. very, very quickly. And so growth was, was challenging in that sense. As we, if we expanded the, the zone, then there were so many more possible routes that the cars could take. Uh, it grows much faster. If we double the area, then you can make the calculation. One could make the argument that we quadrupled the number of vans that we would need to cover that area effectively. And that would, that would start to create a lot of uh, complexity from a financial perspective because we needed a lot of drivers and we didn't have a lot of riders. And so we took the strategy of expanding fairly gradually. We, we started in one area, like York Avenue and First Avenue, Second Avenue, at, to Midtown, and then we waited until we had enough density that the cars were generally full. And then once that happened, then we added another avenue, and then we added another avenue. We sort of expanded uh, in, in this gradual way, trying to maintain a reasonable balance between investment and quality of service and, and utilization of the vehicles. And, and we didn't want to add to congestion also. We didn't want to just dump hundreds of vehicles on the streets that were empty running around with just one person. We wanted all of our vehicles to be well utilized. So every time we expanded to the new zone, we would have a lot of cars that were mostly empty, and then it took a while for mm -hmm. them to sort of catch up. So we expanded to the Upper West Side, and then downtown, and then into Brooklyn, and, and into the five boroughs. And we did that gradually. And then we launched Chicago, and we launched DC. Um, and that's, a, that's sort of where we started to say, OK, we now have something that is working. 
it's working at scale, we can show, we can go to transit agencies and say, look, we're running the service in New York. Ah, uh, New York, that's New York. <laughs> not things like New York, you know, we're not like New York. So then we say, well, we're also running in Chicago, and we're also running it in DC, and look, we started running the service in uh, Orange County, in Ladera Ranch, together with Mercedes-Benz. So we've got this rural, uh, suburban service, and those are all working, and in all of those, we are getting a lot of people into every vehicle every hour. More people, by the way, than you're getting into your public bus. So. Let's talk about that. Maybe we could replace your bus in some cases. We could supplement your bus. We could create a better public transit system. And that was around 2017 where we, we had enough data to start to, to have that conversation. And what was the reception of these different city officials when you did approach them that way? You know, not only does this work in New York, it works in Chicago, it works in parts of Orange County. I mean, they were taken aback, but how much, how quickly could they move on your proposal to team up? Yeah, so I think we, we started doing this in earnest early 2017. We decided that that was a priority. And uh, I would say throughout most of 2017, uh, the reaction we got went something like this. This is really interesting. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, <laughs> sometimes we heard you guys are cute. That was offensive. Uh, um, and generally, there was a lot of skepticism. You know, it, it, yeah. it felt like this was um, some invention that maybe worked some places, and you know, people didn't really believe it. Uh, and we were trying to sell the software, and no one really wanted to pay until, uh, and, and Zach, who works with me, said, we need to give it away for free to someone who ah. will use it, and then tell other people that it works. And I said, oh, we are not giving the software for free. We, uh, it took me about a year to, to sort of become okay with that idea. Um, we also, we, I mean, we did a lot of other stuff. We went to a lot of conferences, and we talked about this, and talked about this, and we presented data, and we got other people to start believing, and other academics, we shared the data with them, we got people to talk about it. And by the end of 2017, we signed up the city of Austin, Texas mm -hmm. um, for a small pilot, and we gave them away, we gave the software to them for free. Uh, we worked with Capital Metro, which is a transit agency of Austin, Texas, and they started using it, and this guy, Joe Ianalo, bless his heart, the chief innovation officer of Cap Metro, just started talking about this all over the country, and, and that, that really uh, opened the door. Now, Austin, did they have their own public transportation system already? They do, right. And how, how elaborate was it? How extensive was it? It was pretty small. They just took an area in a neighborhood called Manor, and uh, they replaced what, they, what was a dial-a-ride service where people would call and say, I need, I need people who have certain disabilities or have certain, uh, um, it's not exactly paratransit, but it's similar, uh, mm -hmm. um, who are eligible for this sort of service would call. They would have to call a day in advance, 24 to 48 hours in advance. And it was a very poor service. And they'd have to wait. Uh, they'd have, usually get an hour or 45 minute window in which they would get picked up and they'd be waiting outside. And we replaced that with our system. So basically, Via, uh, like you know it in New York. If it, how many people here have used Via, by the way? Wow, impressive. That seems very low. Um, <laughs> so uh, you know, the rest of you should come see me afterwards. Um, so you know, it, it was just like using uh, Via or an Uber or a shared Uber, uh, if you will, uh, just much smarter. And it it, it 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 was it was free or it cost two dollars or you know whatever the public transit fare was, and it just replaced this this very antiquated, ineffective service. And I, I think it worked really well, and, and that's really opened the door. And you also worked uh, with the officials in Arlington, Texas, which did not have a public transit offering at right. all. So you had to build something from the ground up. Right, so that came a little bit later. So once we started to get that traction with Austin, uh, one of the next cities to adopt it was Arlington, Texas. Mm -hmm. Arlington uh, is well known in the United States, uh, maybe you guys knew this, as the largest city, uh, about 400,000 residents with no public transportation system whatsoever. And Texas Rangers, I think, right? And the Texas Rangers. Okay. Uh, uh, um, it's a great city. And they had one bus route that they had launched at some point and they were gonna de decommission it. And they decided that they wanted to try. Uh, the mayor actually uh, um, ran into us at a conference and, and liked the concept and said he wanted to try it. And so they ran a pro competitive procurement. Uh, we were fortunate to win it. And then we launched a service using our van. So the way we deploy in, in situations like this in Austin, we simply gave them our software. We think of this as software as a service or SaaS. And then sometimes we have this creatively named transit as a service, where we provide not just the software, but the entire solution. So we'll bring the vans, we'll bring the drivers, we'll run the service, and we will provide the software. We effectively become the MTA of, of that city. That's incredible, the MTA of a particular city. Um, how many partnerships do you have right now with different cities? I, I keep hearing different numbers. Uh, 80, 100? So as of today, we have 115 okay. uh, uh, different partnerships. We're in 22 different countries uh, from Australia, New Zealand, uh, Singapore, Indonesia, Japan. Uh, through the Persian Gulf, quite a few countries in the Persian Gulf, Israel, a bunch of countries in Europe, uh, United States, Brazil, Chile. And some Canada. of these are software as a service, some of these are transit as a service. Exactly. 
these partnerships, are they profitable? Yeah, so you know, the, this I would say uh, this sort of business where we are providing our software or running the transit service on behalf of the city, it's, when, to be clear, except for Arlington and a few other examples, typically we will run a piece of the transit. We will run the dynamic piece. We don't run the buses, mm -hmm. the regular buses. Um, you know, that business model for us is, is, is a sustainable business model, one where, where we can, uh, be, I think, be very successful building uh, a business that makes, I think, a lot of sense. So what do you consider your core business right now? Is it the ride-sharing part of it, or is it the software part of it? Yeah, so we are sort of a weird company. Uh, we, we do both. Uh, we, the, 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 what we call the cons consumer service or direct-to-consumer service, what you would see here in New York or in Chicago, is still a very big part of what we do. And, and we, we feel very strongly that it is the core of, of what allows us to be successful doing all these other services. Because we are the biggest user of our own technology. Okay. And we develop, I think, sort of best in the world operational expertise. We know how to run these services, how to make them effective. We know how, how to incentivize drivers. We know how to incentivize riders to, to adopt the platform. We can tweak the algorithms in the best possible way. A lot of times it comes down to simply efficiency. How do you schedule the drivers at the right time so that you're able to get fill the vehicles up when there is demand. And we, we've just, by running the service ourselves at massive scale across a number of different cities, uh, we have developed that expertise. So it's not just the technology that we provide, mm -hmm. it's also this expertise. So the, the consumer service is really our core. And then the growth is coming from then leveraging that to sell these solutions to, to cities all over the world. What do you think will be your core business in five years? Will it still be the consumer part of it or will it be the software part? So I think we have a very simple vision. Uh, we, we want to be, so it, sort of it's an extension of the software part. We, we want to be providing the digital infrastructure uh, for transportation in every city. So we want to be running the on-demand shuttles, but also the paratransit system and the school buses and, and the, the fixed route buses because I think they all interact. And we want to help the city price use of the road in the right way because I think the fact that today you can just jump in your car and drive by yourself at rush hour creating massive congestion and emissions for free mm. doesn't really make a lot of sense. Now, you may say, well, I don't have much of a choice. I can't get there any other way. But what if there was a choice? What if there was a VIA, uh, just as a random example, that could take you there uh, uh, unbiased for, for $2 or $2.50, $2.75, and you, it would pick you up within 10 minutes, and that was available to you anywhere in the city, and it costs as much as the bus. Well, then, maybe it's not so cool that you're driving by yourself. You know, maybe you should, you should pay something to drive, and then that can be used to subsidize the rest of the system and when we think about it, this, is this MIT study that I mentioned, same study that we did with the taxi data, we could dramatically reduce the number of cars driving around New York City. If instead of driving by yourself or taking an Uber or taking a taxi, which by the way I think of uh, as, uh, and I like to say this, so please don't, don't hate me, is basically the same as walking into a kindergarten and lighting up a cigarette and smoking. Right? This is what you're doing when you choose to drive by yourself. You're inflicting secondhand smoke on all these poor people. Um, I think if you, instead of that, shared your ride or took a bus or took a subway, we could reduce congestion and emissions dramatically across the city. Now, we don't have a great, we can't ask you to do that today because for a lot of trips there's no great solution. But what if there was a great solution? What if there was a subsidized shared shuttle that could get you from anywhere to anywhere at all times for 275? I think that's sort of a, a vision for the city of the future. You keep using the word ride sharing. Uber uses the word ride sharing a lot too, but they use it in a very different way. I mean, because what's happening there, unless you're using Uber Pool, you're not sharing a ride with anyone. Right. Um, so they, they kind of cemented that word first. And in, in a way, they co-opted it. Yeah, it's a little unfortunate, but that's right. I mean, they, they basically looked at, and I think Lyft and Sidecar started doing this. They, they uh, basically said, you're sharing a ride with the driver. Right. right? That's how, when Lyft said San Francisco, they said, <laughs> the, the driver's driver, sharing his car with you. That's right. There, there was, you remember the fist bump, Lyft, you know, you get in the Lyft, you sort of fist bump, it was your friend. And I think the idea was, the driver isn't really a professional driver, he's just a guy or, or a woman who, who's going there kind of anyways, and so you're just sharing the ride with your driver. And they sort of co-opted, as you say, that term, uh, and unfortunately made that term sort of not as positive as I think it could be. So uh, anyway, we, we think about maybe ride pooling or, or dynamic shuttles as, as a better way to explain that. You announced, you talked about school buses, and you announced a partnership with uh, New York City's Department of Education last summer, where you'll be licensing your technology to modernize the school bus system, imagine that. So how did that come about? Because that's gonna be extremely complicated and this is obviously something that has a lot of room for improvement because you always hear the stories of kids waiting forever or kids being stuck on buses for hours on end. I mean, this is a real, I mean, this is a web to, to deal with, a, a big, big, complex system. Yes. Um, 
So this is something we're super excited about. It's, uh, it, it came about, uh, so we, we, you know, we just actually finalized the agreement with the Department of Education uh, late last year, but we, it was announced that we won the contract a few months ago. The, I have to give tremendous credit to the de Blasio administration and to the Department of Education. After, if you guys remember, uh, for those of you in New York, uh, not this past November, but no, the year before then, there was a terrible snowstorm and a number of school buses got lost, yes. basically. Particularly, which is hard to imagine how that happens. And, and it was like 2018. Kids were stuck on buses for hours, right? Kids were stuck on, some kids, and these were mostly special needs kids, uh, uh, rather terribly, did not make it home till 3 or 4 a.m. It was hard to imagine. You know, some of these kids, they cannot be stuck on the bus for, for, for so many hours. Um, and so there's a huge, huge outcry, and, and the city, so this started maybe, I have to give credit maybe to Ben Kalos of the city council that represents the Upper East Side for passing a, a law that, you know, we didn't really pay much attention to that required the Department of Education to track every one of their school buses with GPS and be able to report to parents where those buses are. So that's kind of the genesis of that idea. And then the DOA thinking about, well, how are we, the heck are we going to comply with this, started to look at what solutions are available. Uh, and, and we ended up getting in touch with them and, and had a conversation and, Sort of started. We started thinking about this. We'd never really thought of school buses, but for us, it was part of this vision of, of digital infrastructure. We want to be providing digital infrastructure for everything, including school buses. So this was very interesting. Mm -hmm. So we started to think about what a solution like this would look like. And inspired by that conversation, we we partnered with the city of West Sacramento in California. So there's a city of Sacramento, and then there's also another city called West Sacramento, which I didn't know about until we started working with them just across the Sacramento River. And um, it's a small town, and we we provide an on-demand uh, a transit service for. So we said to them, hey, we have this idea. Would you guys mind if we worked with your school buses and we could help you run your school buses more effectively? And we have a great relationship with the city and the mayor. And they said, sure, come by and see what we can do. So we started building a system uh, for West Sacramento. And in parallel, the, the DOE here in New York, Department of Education, moved forward with their plans and issued a, an, an RFP, a request for proposal, uh, for people to respond and provide, to basically propose a system. So we, we proposed the following system. The idea is that every bus driver will have a, a tablet on their bus that has essentially the Via Driver app. So if you imagine what the driver sees, he'll, he'll see that he or she will see all the stops, all the stops that they have to make and all the kids they have to pick up. Um, parents will have an app, a uh, parent app, where they can tra track where the bus is and see when their child boards the bus and gets off the bus because the, each child will have either on their smartphone, if they have a smartphone, or on a little piece of paper or a little key tag, will have a QR code that they'll scan as they get on and off the bus. So it's a little bit, boarding a school bus, a yellow school bus will become very much like boarding an airplane. Uh, you will scan your boarding pass, and then you'll scan off when you get off. So we'll be able to track all the kids. We'll be able to track all the buses through the GPS and the tablet, and the bus driver won't have to memorize their route in advance. They'll just follow the route. Mm -hmm. And the parents will be able to track their, their, their child. In the background, we will also show the DOE, which today they don't have that view, and we'll show every school and every bus yard where all the buses are and what they're doing and which kids have been picked up. So they'll have a console. They'll be able to track it all. All of the apps are interconnected, so they're able to communicate with parents, with children, uh, with bus drivers, and so forth. And behind that, there's a whole routing system that we will then replace with our routes. So to be clear, it's not that students are going to sit at home and book seats on a yellow bus. That's not how it's going to work. They're still going to go to their bus stop and get on the yellow bus at the time that they're supposed to. But the experience will change from, you know, today it's snowing or 20 degrees. I don't know if you guys have kids in public school who take the bus, but you go downstairs at 7 a.m. and you wait. <coughs> And sometimes the bus comes and... Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't. And then you put your kid on and you hope that she made it to school. And, you know, most times she does. And then uh, on the way back, you go down at 2.20 or whenever and you wait. And sometimes the bus comes. Sometimes it's five minutes late and you start to freak out because you're thinking, where's my daughter? And uh, that whole experience just doesn't really fit with 2020. So mm -hmm. we're trying to uh, uh, change it. Well, in 2020, you also have to deal with things like privacy and security issues yes. and on your platform you will have access to a lot of information that's very sensitive uh, names of students their addresses their parents contact details how are you going to manage that yeah so i think you know that's that's the the sort of the the challenge of technology right every time we want to do one of those things we are entering a realm of, of increased risk around mm -hmm. privacy so before we didn't know where johnny was at all once he boarded the bus now we know where he is but maybe someone else can have access to that information. So I think maintaining privacy, and we are working very closely with the DOE to do that, and ensuring that we have the right levels of security, the right protocols, that it isn't the case that anyone at VIA, uh, just because they work here, uh, work there, can, can go into the system and see where your child is. They're very strict permissioning, and we follow very strict guidelines around how to do that. And I think that is a key. It's also a key that we, unlike some other companies in the space, 
We don't consider this data ours. We consider the data to belong to the Department yeah. of Education. So we cannot sell the data. We cannot use it for marketing. It is all uh, data that belongs to the city. But I think it's a, you know, this is something we have to get right. There's yeah. no question. We talked about uh, Uber and Lyft and how on your end, the software part of your business, the partnerships is sustainable. That was your word. Um, Uber and Lyft, uh, they're publicly traded. They IPO'd, um, not necessarily to great fanfare. They're not making money. They're still losing money, and everyone's pushing for a path to profitability. I just want to get your take on what you see. Is do you see a path to profitability for these guys? I mean, how do they how do they make this work? Yeah, I you know I think uh, so. I, I'm pretty bullish on on ride hailing in general or ride sharing. I, I think that there's I absolutely think there's a tremendous business there that has already been built and that. That will be around. I, I think when you just just think about your experience as a as a consumer, as you started our our little talk, uh, um, what's changed for the better about transportation in New York City? It's it's mostly the ride hailing, ride sharing apps, and maybe City Bike, um, right? Th those are the change. I mean, what is it? The signs in the subway that tell you, and some of the subways that tell you when some of the trains <laughs> are coming some of the time. That's been the great improvement in the last decade. There's just not been a lot. Uh, as New Yorkers, that's that's gotten better. And I think what has gotten dramatically better is that, you know, if I need to get from point A to point B and the subway for some reason doesn't work for me, I can book a ride on any number of apps and I can share my ride or not share my ride and that ride shows up in a few minutes and it's very reliable. You know, that that's a fantastic improvement versus 10 years ago, if you needed a taxi at 8 a.m. or at 5 p.m., I mean, good luck. You, 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 you had no shot and that, that was not a great situation. So I think you know, all this to say that I think these businesses provide real value, uh, and I think there's a big market for ride hailing. I, I think you know, my, this is my analysis now, um, and this is not based on any specific information that I have. Just kind of looking at at them, I think there was a promise that was made by by companies like Uber and Lyft and Didi about how big they were going to get and how quickly they were going to to their deal investors, it, to their investors, to the public. And that was uh, really only possible to meet by discounting the rides very significantly and keeping the fares very, very low. At the end of the day, it is a taxi service that probably should be priced close to a taxi. And if it is priced that way, then it's a profitable service and it, it makes a lot of sense. And when you're trying to grow that quickly, the only way to do it is to basically make it so cheap that people who wouldn't normally take a taxi would start taking a taxi. So I think there's just what we're seeing now is the market sort of evening itself out ah. uh, um, it, to me. And, and I, I do think that you know there's these are tremendous businesses, and they're in the long term. You know, if they manage themselves right, they, they're going to be very valuable. So, if they do raise their prices, they stop subsidizing the rides. What does that mean for Revia? I think it, you know, it makes the competition a bit more fair, mm. to be honest, uh, um, and, and, a, and a bit more um, about who has the best product and who has the best offering versus uh, who can afford to subsidize the rides the most. And you know. We, we have raised uh, uh, some money, but certainly not the billions that Uber and Lyft have, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. You've mentioned an IPO um, in other comments, um, an impossible two-year horizon. What does that look like? What needs to happen in the next two years for that to, to happen? To happen. I, you know, I think we have, so we have a very clear target uh, for ourselves, uh, and you know, we, we absolutely have a goal to IPO uh, to take this company public. I think, I think this company makes a lot of sense as a public company. Uh, mm -hmm. The sort of business that we run, I think we should be subject to the scrutiny of the public markets. I think we, we, we do something that's very public. Uh, so I would absolutely like to go there. I think that's the right direction. I think what we need to do is, is just grow this, this uh, what we call partnerships business, where we either sell our software or sell transportation services to cities. And um, we've really only been at it for the last couple of years in any meaningful way. And so just needs to keep growing the way that we're hoping it will, and hopefully we'll get there. You don't hear very many people say we'd like to be subject to the public scrutiny. I know, I know, maybe it's weird. My, uh, some of my uh, colleagues think I'm crazy, but I think, um, I think that's important for, this, for what we are doing. If we're going to, you know, so today we're, we're working with the Department of Education. As you said, there's questions around security and privacy. Um, I think the stuff we do is very, very public, and, uh, you know, we, at the moment, we have to be a private company. We're still growing, and it's the only way for us to get there. But I, I think that's the right thing to do in a few years, as soon as we can. All right, let's open uh, the conversation up to questions from the audience. Raise your hand uh, over here in the second row. If we can pass a microphone over so she can ask her question to Daniel. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, very inspiring. I love Via, I use it all the time. Um, besides the Shirut taxis, how did your Israeli upbringing help with your success? Ah, that's a tricky question. Um, <laughs> how did my Israeli upbringing help with my success? You know, I think uh, Israelis uh, tend to start a lot of companies. It's probably fairly well known. We have a very big uh, high-tech startup industry in Israel. And uh, I often think about why is it that Israelis start so many companies? W what is it about it, about Israelis that make us want to do that? And a lot of people point to the military service or to being a small nation that sort of uh, has uh, real security threats and sort of creates that sort of uh, personality. I, I, I don't really know. I think what I see is that every Israeli I work with genuinely believes that the only reason they are not the CEO uh, of the company is because when that CEO title was handed down, they happened to be in the bathroom. Otherwise, they would have totally <laughs> been the CEO. They, they totally should be the CEO. And I think that that uh, sort of attitude of, you know, what are you talking about? I should be in charge. I totally know how to do this. Uh, um, you know, has its negatives, uh, but, but for the most part helps with, with just having that, uh, um, that belief that you can do this, which, which, is, a, which is a big part of, of what this is. I think you have to have uh, the belief in, in yourself, in, in your vision, and I mean, you, know, you can't have too much of it because then you miss the, the signals and you don't know how to adjust in, in real time in the way that's necessary, but you, you, you have to have that confidence, I think, which you know, Israelis tend to be good at. Great question. Over here, gentlemen in the third row. Um, I was just interested um, with VIA or when you're doing um, MTA as a service, when, sorry, um, oh, the after rush hour, what you're doing with all the vehicles, what you're doing with the MTA, how you're solving that problem. Besides routing, that would be the second biggest issue. Bus is yeah, I would say the, the two key things, that's absolutely right, the two key things about making a, a transit system efficient is having the right number of vehicles on the road at the right time, as I mentioned earlier, and then sort of routing them and positioning them and matching them with passengers in, in the right way, which is the second piece. Um, the first piece tends to get a little neglected. Everybody sort of thinks about how hard it is to route the vehicles in real time to meet the demand and think about, you know, uh, when we think about our routing, it's not just we're going to pick you up and take you to your destination in the fastest way because that might be a way that you know, is, is the highway, for example, taking, if you go from here uh, downtown, maybe taking the FDR is the fastest way, but on the FDR, we're not able to pick up anybody else. So we have to actually, you know, take Lexington all the way down. So how much time does that add? And does that make sense? And um, people tend to miss the other piece, which is how many vehicles should you have on the road at all? Because there may just not be enough demand to fill them, or you may have too few. And that uh, data science problem is something that we invest in hugely. So we have, uh, I would argue, really sophisticated models that predict how much demand we're going to see in every one of our services at any given minute. And based on that, how many vehicles we need and what kinds of vehicles and where they should be placed. And I would say that is a huge piece of making the system that a lot of times people uh, don't necessarily think about. How do we get them off the road? Uh, so it depends on the service. You know, uh, he, uh, here in New York, typically uh, folks just take the vehicles home. Uh, um, but um, in other services, you know, they may go to a parking garage and, and park there. Um, so you, know, you have to kind of plan out the how many vehicles you need for the peak and where they should go. All right, over here, a uh, gentleman in the second row. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, how you doing? Everyone Hi. else needs a mic. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no problem. So in my, I guess, previous career, I was a data scientist and an industrial engineer for UPS. And the fact that you have I guess this transit system, have you considered maybe tackling like the last mile with respect to package delivery? Yeah, uh, we have. Uh, I would say, just to clarify very, maybe very briefly, the problem that UPS solves, at, at least sort of at a high level, is, is related, but it's quite different from the problem that we solve. UPS, and maybe I'm uh, sort of simplifying too much, but generally knows that they have 10,000 packages they have to deliver and they have thousand trucks and, and the trucks are parked here and the packages are here and this is where they need to deliver those packages tomorrow and then they distribute those and they plan out all the routes. And that's a very hard problem that we typically don't solve. We've started to think about that problem as well. The problem we solve is we have no idea how many uh, riders we're going to have and where they're going to come from. We don't even know sometimes where, when the drivers are going to show up on the platform and when they're going to sign in and where they'll be when they sign in and how long they'll stay. 
And we have to kind of manage all of that in real time. So we solve what's known as the online problem versus a UPS or a FedEx that solves what's called the offline problem, where you can plan everything in advance because you know where all the packages are going. Now, there are package delivery problems. We're starting to look at that offline problem. So for school buses, for paratransit, all these things are determined offline. So that's, uh, that's what we have to solve. Uh, but we're starting to look at packages in real time. So you want to order from Amazon, you want to get it in an hour. That's a sort of online, on-demand problem that we could probably tackle with our system. We've thought about it a lot. Um, we have our hands full at the moment with moving people. Uh, so we've mostly been focused on that. But I think it is a very interesting direction. To go. All right, people first, packages second. Um, We're about people at Via. Uh, right here in front, in the red jacket. One second, we'll bring you a mic. What do you think is the future of one driver, one car? Um, could there be a VIA for the whole country? I'm up and down to New Hampshire. My boyfriend's in New Hampshire. I'm toe to toe in traffic, and everyone else around me is it's one car, one driver. How do you see in the next five, ten, and into the future? Could could I get a VIA one day? I sure hope so. Um, yeah, I mean, it seems obvious that you should be able to improve that. I think that problem, the long distance problem, is is a little bit harder because it's typically you'd probably have to solve it as a multi-leg problem. You need something that takes you up and down the highway and then something that distributes you uh, once you get there. Um, so it's a harder problem. So maybe that's like next decade idea. Uh, but yeah. You just mapped out what's a, what Daniel's going to be working on in the future. All right, I'm one, on it. One final question from this gentleman over here in the, at the end of the row. Thank you so much. We are one of the early adopters of VIA, and we <laughs> love the guys. service. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how to ask this question, but for... I want to get your recommendation on go-to-market plan for ideas that can serve really well B2B, like your algorithms, mm -hmm. and multi-sided market, two-sided, it's always hard how to get these guys not to have more of this and that. So ideas that can fit both, how do you not get tempted with the B2B because it's the easiest route and then you can get some sort of licensing fee and stuff like that? Yeah, that's a... So I, I, I apologize, that's a hard question to answer in the abstract, I think. Um, I, you know, for us, actually, the B2C was, was easier. It was very hard to get these B2B customers to adopt the technology. Once they did it, you know, things changed. I, I think you, you really want to figure out what is, to some extent, what is your core solution? Is your core solution a consumer solution or is it a B2B solution? Uh, and, and, then, and then go after that and probably spend, I don't know if this answers your question, but maybe spend a year or two just doing that before you, trying to do both. I can tell you from my experience right now at Via is that it is a little bit of a different culture. The people who you need to run the B2B teams, those are quite different from the people who you need to run B2C companies. And you know, I think we're now figuring out how to make it all work together. But starting from scratch, trying to build up both teams, that would that would be hard. I think. Can we get another round of applause for Daniel and Scarlett? Thank you.